Hi everyone, I'm Catherine. I'm a renal pharmacist from um, Manchester University NHS Hospital Foundation Trust. And I am currently undertaking some research with kidney patients looking at blood thinning drugs, um, as well as kind of working in a specialist kind of transplant and renal centre. I also have some roles within the UK Kidney Association and I'm currently working on some guidelines uh, linking in with kidney patients around symptom control. Rob, do you want to introduce yourself? Yep. Thanks, Catherine. I'm Robert Brown. I'm a kidney pharmacist at North Bristol NHS Trust. Um, we're quite a big unit and I'm interested in a lot of things, particularly acute kidney injury and dialysis. Um, but very general is my background. I used to be a heart pharmacist before I moved over to doing kidneys. Thanks, Rob. So we're going to be doing this webinar together. So if you could just move to the next slide, please, Pete. So as Andrea mentioned, last year I was part of the annual conference and I did a, um, a session on what my kidney pharmacist does. So that was kind of the background, what our role is and what we do. And you'll be able to access that if you wanted to go back and have a look at kind of what our role is and how we can help you. Um, so today we wanted to do something a little bit different and the topics we've picked have come from kind of what patients have told us and also what's topical at the minute. So we're going to be looking at interactions with kidney medicines, including some herbal and kind of pharmacy medicines. And then Rob's going to talk a little bit about prescription exemptions because they can be a little bit complicated and particularly how you might be able to get your medicines a little bit cheaper. Patients that I was talking to recently said they would like to know what medicines they have to get from the hospital rather from their own GP. And then Rob's going to talk about some new groundbreaking medicines that are coming that are around at the minute for kidney patients. And this is quite exciting for us because we've not had any new exciting treatments in kind of kidney medicine for a long time so if you could skip to the next slide please Pete so we know that lots of different specialists might be involved in your care so as well as being under your kidney team you're going to get to see your GP you might get medicines from them you might be under heart doctors and other different doctors so interactions come up quite a lot in what we do and patients have said it can be quite difficult um, making sure that everyone's aware of what might interact with their medicines. So when we're thinking about interactions we're thinking about a drug that might affect um, another drug or a drug that might affect a medical condition and so what can happen is with a drug and another drug, it might reduce the action of that drug. So it just doesn't work. It might increase the kind of action of the drug. So you might get terrible side effects or it might have no effect um, on the actions of the drugs, but just cause terrible side effects. So we really don't want that to happen. And it can also happen with things, foods and supplements. And I will touch on those towards the end. But I think we think less about um, interactions that we have with drugs and medical conditions. So I'm just going to talk about some common ones that we see because it is particularly important with kidney disease. If you could move to the next slide, please, Pete. So some of the common drug drug interactions that we see in our patients. Um, these are just the most common drugs. So tacrolimus and cyclosporin, warfarin and tolvactam. Now these seem to interact with lots of different medicines. So some of the common ones that we see that might be prescribed by your GP um, are the antibiotics, clarithromycin and erythromycin because they seem to be kind of a go-to antibiotic if people have penicillin allergies. And they can increase the levels of those drugs, um, leading to unwanted kind of side effects and high levels. Fluconazole, which is used for thrush, might be prescribed by the GP. 
And again, that can increase the levels of those drugs. So there are lots and lots of different interactions, but these are just a few of the most common ones that we see. And I know that cartoon is quite comical. Um, my drugs are interacting, but it is quite a, co a complex and difficult area in patients with kidney disease, particularly when you're on, it can be on lots of different medicines, there's kind of more chance of interactions happening. If you could move to the next slide, please, Pete. So one of the common kind of drug and medical condition oh, yeah, interactions I mean, is um, I've had Claire Hegarty uh, on the phone asking me about something. Is, is with the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs such as naproxen or ibuprofen or diclofenac. So I'm sure most of you are aware we try and avoid these in patients with kidney disease, but because you can now buy ibuprofen anywhere, like B&M bargains, I do still see kidney patients coming in with these when they come into hospital. So the reason we kind of avoid these drugs in patients with kidney disease stages three to five is because they can affect the blood flow to the kidney, which will reduce which can reduce kidney function, so the creatinine can go up. They can also prevent potassium from being excreted from the body, leading to increased potassium levels. They can increase fluid retention, and then that can lead to increased blood pressure. So these are just the short-term side effects. There are lots of kind of long-term side effects with them as well, but this is kind of one of the common kind of drug medical condition interactions we see and why we don't use these drugs in kidney disease. If you could move to the next slide, please, Pete. Another one that can be particularly difficult and GPs are faced with is the use of antibiotics for urinary tract infections in kidney patients. So we try and avoid nitrofurantoin in anybody with stage three kidney disease or below and trimethoprim for anyone with stage four kidney disease or below. And this is because you need adequate kidney function to get enough levels of the drug down into the kind of ureter and the bladder to actually kill the infection and the bugs. So they actually don't work well enough um, because the levels of antibiotics aren't high enough to kill the bugs. And also trimethoprim is known for increasing potassium levels. So we try and avoid these drugs for treating urinary tract infections in kidney patients. Next slide, please, Pete. Now, I just wanted to bring in gout um, because we get a lot of questions from GPs and patients um, about gout. And it is very common in patients with kidney disease so nearly a quarter of patients with stage four or five kidney disease might experience gout and it's agonizing and quite debilitating so it's a real problem and we know patients with kidney disease are not only at increased risk because they're not excreting um, uric acid properly but also they might be on um fluid tablets for fluids, the water tablets, such as fruzamide, which increases the risk. And medicines such as cyclosporin and tacrolimus also increase the risk. So we do see it in our transplant patients as well. So the difficulties with the treatment options are um, for acute gout, we've got three options. So with steroids, we've got to be a bit careful in patients who have diabetes because we're, we're thinking that the steroids might affect the blood sugars. With colchicine, we're thinking about potential drug-drug interactions. If somebody's on cyclosporin or tacrolimus, they can increase the levels of colchicine, making patients much more um, susceptible to the nasty side effects. And also in kidney disease, we have to reduce the dose of colchicine as well. And then the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs we've already talked about, we try and avoid them in patients with stage three CKD and below. So it can be quite a difficult task to manage this. And, you know, your specialist team is available to try and help if you're kind of struggling with managing this. Um, and I'll talk about our, how we manage it in our transplant patients in a second. 
And in longer term management, we've got to consider potential drug drug interactions if somebody's on azathioprine. So if you have an autoimmune kidney disease, or you might be on azathioprine for a transplant, then that might interact with our kind of preferred long-term therapies, allopurinol or fibroxostat. Next slide, please, Pete. So this is what we give to um, currently to our transplant patients, but I think we need to adapt it and use it a bit more widely for some of our um, other kidney patients as well is a little interaction card so it's the same size as a credit card we give it to all our transplant patients before discharge and they can carry it around with them and this seemed to work really well because we actually have put our contact details on there and patients can actually ring us up if they're concerned about particular interactions and we also get GPs ringing us up when the patients actually sat with them because it might have highlighted specific antibiotics that might not be appropriate for them. But I would always say if you've got somebody prescribing certain medicines for you and you might be concerned about interactions, just ask them, are these OK to take with my kidney medicines? Are these OK for me to take with my current kidney function? And it just gets them thinking about um, those interactions. Next slide, please, Pete. So one of the most kind of common over the counter medicines or medicines that you buy in a pharmacy where you have to have a pharmacist present are about cough and cold remedies. Now, there is potential for kind of um, interactions with patients with kidney disease. And we try and tell our patients to avoid anything that contains ephedrine, phenylephrine or pseudoephedrine. Um, because they can all increase blood pressure and they're used as kind of decongestants. The problem is there are just so many different products available now for coughs and colds. It can be a bit of a minefield and we did try to produce some information locally, but it became a bit difficult. So it's either kind of you checking the box or ask the pharmacist who's in the pharmacy, is this okay for me to take? Next slide, please, Pete. So I just want to touch a little bit on kind of herbal medicines. So um, because they're natural, people tend to think that herbal medicines are quite safe and they're very often used alongside their prescription medicines. Now, when patients come to clinic or they come to hospital, they don't always kind of tell us that they're taking them and we're actually very bad at asking people whether they're taking them as well. There have been some herbal medicines that have been banned from the UK due to severe toxicities. And there are some products out there, some kind of Chinese medicine that contains toxic contaminants such as arsenic or mercury. Now, both of them agents are associated with kidney injury. Um, so they are very nasty. So we wouldn't want to be kind of taking anything that had that in. Um, next slide, please, Pete. So the most popular kind of herbal or supplement thing that I get asked about is cannabidiol or better known as CBD oil. It seems to be really popular. And actually, it's even I've seen it sold in some pharmacies as well, which almost kind of is advertising that it's safe. Now, the problem is it can um, interact with certain medicines. It, it prevents the breakdown of certain drugs. And we actually have some data now that suggests it increased the levels of tacrolimus by threefold. Now, because it does that, that would suggest it's going to have an impact on some of those other medicines, such as warfarin, tolvaptan as well. So we've got to be really careful using these kind of medicines. And we also know in, in patients with kidney impairment, some of the components of CBD oil can hang around a lot longer, um, leading to more side effects. Now, because it's not regulated, there can be small amounts of um, the tetrahydrocannabidol, I can't say it, sorry, or THC, the active kind of cannabis. And this can potentially accumulate. And there were reports initially when it came out of 
people being drug tested using this so it is something to be really kind of cautious about so I, I do try and advise my patients to avoid using this because there isn't actually any data yet that supports its use um, as an, in terms of efficacy. Next slide, please, Pete. Now, turmeric seems to be um, the supplement of the moment. So usual amounts of turmeric in your cooking are absolutely fine. We're not concerned about that. It's kind of high amounts in the supplements and this can affect, um, again, certain enzymes that break down drugs. So it can lead to increased levels of drugs. Um, so particularly, again, warfarin, tacrolimus, cyclosporin, chemotherapy drugs, tolbactam. And we had a patient recently who came in taking warfarin and her blood was over 10 times thinner than it should have been. Um, and the only thing that had changed was the turmeric capsules. But it took us kind of us asking a good few times for us to kind of remember that she was taking these because, again, people don't associate kind of herbal or supplements with kind of causing those kind of problems. St. John's wort, that's one that's been around a long time and that has lots of interactions with drugs. Cranberry juice can interact with things like warfarin and we know grapefruit juice can also interact with some of our medicines and also cholesterol lowering medicines such as statins. So my advice really is always speak to your kidney pharmacist or your kidney team before you're thinking of taking any supplements or any herbal medicines, just so that we can check out and make sure that they would be safe for you um, and whether we need to undertake any additional kind of monitoring. And I think I'm handing over to you now, Rob. Thanks, Catherine. So what we thought it would also be helpful to talk about would be prescription charges, especially thinking about the cost of living and the increased energy bills at the moment. And just to recap for where you might want to look and how it differs between the devolved nations. Um, so in England, prescriptions cost £9.35 per item, although everywhere else in the UK, they're free. So if you're currently paying for your prescriptions, it's worth checking out whether you might be eligible for free prescriptions. The list of those is quite medium to long, so I'm not going to go through them right now, but I'll point you to where you can go to look to check. But it's things like how much money you earn, whether you receive any income support or universal credit. The other group where you may be eligible for free prescriptions is if you're eligible for a medical exemption certificate. That's something that you have to apply for, but there are, and the conditions that are included in a medical exemption haven't been reviewed in the, this country for quite a few decades now, but it includes things like hypothyroidism, diabetes, um, pregnancy comes within that, although slightly separately. If you're not eligible for any of those, it's worth considering a prepayment certificate. Otherwise, you might want to think of that like a season ticket. You can get those for three months or 12 months. Um, and generally, if you have more than one, more than two items a month, they're usually more cost effective. Um, so if I could have the next slide, please, Pete. So a really good place that I find is really easy to look at to try and work out whether you may or may not be eligible before you go straight to the NHS websites is Martin Lewis's Money Saving Expert website. Um, and that will guide you through to who's eligible for free ones, the link to how to apply for medical exemption certificate, and also the link to prepayment certificates. And it's really helpfully written, and I prefer that if you just want to have a look through and see if you might be eligible. He also talks about some medicines that are available over the counter that if you're currently getting them on prescription and paying, you may wish to choose to not pay for them and purchase them. 
So if I could have the next slide, please, Pete. I've put the website addresses down there in full, just in case you want to type them in later or go back onto this on the recording. The second one is for the official NHS Business Services Agency website. So that's often the other place you can go and look. Um, but as I said, the Money Saving Expert website will link you to those bits once you've found the bits that are relevant to you. And then next slide, please, Pete. So Catherine mentioned that we'd talk about which medicines are usually prescribed by your hospital specialist. And often then that means traditionally you'd also have picked them up from hospital as well. Although in the last probably 10, 15 years, something called home care or home deliveries become a lot more common around the country for these specialist medicines that are also prescribed by your hospital. And in that group, it's often the anti-rejection medicines. If you've had a kidney transplant, things like adipor or tacrolimus, immunosuppression medicines. If you've got autoimmune kidney disease or a transplant, things like prednisolone or azathioprine. Um, all the EPOs, otherwise known as erythropoietin, and the most common one we use in the UK is diboperitin or aranesp. Things to bind phosphate like renaser or lanthanum or salivamir. And one of the newer ones that's still um, very much prescribed by hospitals are the potassium binders like localma. So all of those are usually prescribed by your kidney doctors in hospital. And you may either pick them up from your local kidney units or get them on home delivery. Um, on to the next slide, please, Pete. So there's two game changing therapies that we wanted to talk about. And I've chosen to talk about the SGLT2 inhibitors and a new medicine that's very new even to Catherine and I for kidney anemia. So next slide, please, Pete. So the SGLT2 inhibitors are otherwise known as flozins. The Americans quite like to call them flozins and that terms cottoning on in the UK because on the next slide we'll see all their drug names end in F-L-O-Z-I-N-S. It's short for sodium glucose co-transport 2 inhibitors and these were a group of medicines that were originally developed for diabetes and they work on the SGLT2 channel within your kidneys in exchange in kidney out into the urine that your kidney produces. So it lowers your blood sugar levels by weighing that sugar out into your urine. Um, and they stop your kidney reabsorbing it, which is what normally happens. But in the research and clinical trials for these drugs for diabetes, there were signals that they were also protective for your heart, especially if you had heart failure or heart artery disease or sometimes called coronary heart disease and then later not long later though they were also shown to be beneficial if you had chronic kidney disease and they were protected of that so there's something going on with these drugs slightly more than just having a diabetes effect and then the drug company started trying them in people without diabetes and we also showed the benefits there so there's something protective at probably a cellular level that's protective and perhaps generates renewal in the tissues at molecular level of the kidneys and the heart. So they're really strong drugs for people with heart failure, coronary artery disease and chronic kidney disease. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about why they're game changing for chronic kidney disease in one of the latest slides. So if I could have the next slide, please, Pete. So there's currently four of them available in the UK, canagliflozin, dapagliflozin, empagliflozin, and agurtaflozin. They're all indicated, or sometimes you'll hear your doctors or pharmacists use the word licensed for slightly different things. So 
at the moment, they're not all licensed or indicated for chronic kidney disease, um, although they all do have a diabetes license. Um, but that's why we call them flozins, because they all end in the same ending. Can I have the next slide, please, Pete? So that currently the only one that's licensed for chronic kidney disease is a medicine called dapagliflozin. And that's been shown to prevent the progression of kidney disease. It slows the time taken to reach dialysis if you take it for continuously. And it helps some patients to live longer. And what I mean by that is it, because it's got these heart protective benefits as well, then that might mean that some patients live longer because they also take longer to develop the heart problems as well that can often come later on with chronic kidney disease. And to pick up that theme again, it can reduce hospital admissions for heart failure as well. So it's got a license for chronic kidney disease in people who are diabetic and non-diabetic. And because it slows the progression of the chronic kidney disease. This is something really game changing for us in kidney medicine. The last drugs that we've had that slow the progression of general chronic kidney disease were probably the ACE inhibitors that end in Pril or the angiotensin receptor blockers that end in TAM. So they're really important ones and they've been around for about a year now. Can I have the next slide, please, Pete? So in England, the body that tells us who we should offer these medicines to is called NICE. And NICE have said that we should be offering dapagliflozin to people with chronic kidney disease if they've got a kidney function between 25 and 75 percent. So 75 percent is quite high. It's often before you will go and meet a kidney doctor in a hospital. And then if you've also got type 2 diabetes or you've got protein in your urine above this number of 22.6. So we're trying to get them used out there when you're still known to your GP and your kidney functions starting to go down. You've got kidney stage um, above three. So still in kidney stage two. And you've also got either diabetes or protein in your urine. So there's something to think about even before you're known to kidney units. And that's the challenge at the moment in getting the people that are eligible to them to be checked out if they have the protein in the urine and they could be eligible for taking one of these and starting them. So they get the most benefit for the most time. On to the next slide, please, Pete. And then something completely different is a new drug called Roxadustat that's for kidney related anemia. Now I've pinched this slide off the drug company and I'm not going to mention their name, but the slide helps me frame how the drug works because it's quite new to all of us, the mechanism. So the lady there is in a lounge at the top of the mountains up high. And that reminds us that this new drug called Roxadustat is a HIF inhibitor. Um, and if you just forgive me, I'll just wind back and just remind us why kidney disease is important. Um, renal anemia is important in chronic kidney disease. And when you've got anemia associated with chronic kidney disease, it makes you feel quite rotten and it can increase your risk of um, being more poorly in the longer term and feeling rubbish. So it tends to, renal anemia tends to start when your kidney function drops by about 50%. It doesn't normally trouble us until your kidney function goes down to about 60%. As your kidney function tails off, there's a need to do something more about the renal anemia. A traditional thing to do is replace the iron. And then once you've done that, um, you need to think about helping the kidney hormones help um, 
increase the amount of hemoglobin in your blood. So roxadustat's one of those drugs that can do that. And it's mimicking what your body would normally do when it's at high altitude, going back to the picture on the screen. So it mimics these HIF pH enzymes and it is, nat is mimicking what the body would naturally do when it was starved of oxygen. So when the body's more starved of oxygen at a higher level up a mountain, if you like, it stimulates your kidney to produce more erythropoietin, which is the hormone that the kidney secretes to increase the levels of hemoglobin, which it goes down when your kidney function gets worse. So we're gonna stimulate it to do more and that can then increase your hemoglobin and you get less symptomatic from the renal anemia. So traditionally the drug we've got at the moment to, stim to give um, erythropoietin is to give it synthetically with darbopoietin, otherwise known as Aranesp or some of the other drugs like Mycera. This one's slightly different and it's altering the mechanism in your body for it to produce more erythropoietin itself. On to the next slide piece, Pete. So this one's quite new. So in England, the guidance from NICE only came out in July. So that means that most hospitals can start prescribing it from around October time. And NICE have said that we can use it for kidney patients who have got symptomatic anemia associated with, with chronic kidney disease. If they have stage three to five kidney disease and we've already corrected their iron deficiency and they're not already on dialysis. So that could be hemodialysis or peritoneal dialysis when they start treatment. So when we've talked about this in our hospitals and to our colleagues, probably the people that this would benefit most to start with would probably be people that have chosen not to have the injectable erythropoietin hormones like Aranesp or darbopoietin, especially where they're very um, either scared of needles or needles are very uncomfortable experience for them to have. And it's an oral tablet. It's the first in its class and it's taken three times a week. So it's the first time we've had anything other than an injectable medicine to try and correct the lack of erythropoietin in the body. Can I have the next slide, please, Pete? And I was just going to say in Scotland, they haven't yet made a decision on Roxadustat yet. So we don't know how Scotland are going to um, say who should be offered Roxadustat. They often do follow England, but sometimes Scotland, it's a little bit different. So thank you for listening to Catherine and I. I think we're now going to let Pete collate the questions for us and take the questions from you. Yes, thank you very much, Robert and Catherine. I think that was um, enlightening and um, in layman's terms as well. So hopefully everyone understood that. Um, you were just talking about that last drug. Um, is it an expensive drug? Um, it is. And to be completely candid, the prices that the NHS is allowed to purchase it for is confidential but it is expensive yes and it's a medicine that um local they're now calling them integrated healthcare systems or ics's it's the new name for health boards or ccgs they have to sort of fund find the money out of their own balances for it but it is expensive yes but I can't tell you the price. Thank you. Um, we were it's talking less about... than the... Yes, yeah, sorry. Sorry, we Pete. It's less than earlier. the price... Sorry, go ahead, Robert. No, I was going to say it's less than the price if you Googled it anyway. Right, OK. Um, Catherine was talking about prescriptions or yourself was talking about prescriptions. If you have a fistula, are you exempt from prescriptions? The accurate answer is you're only exempt if you need a dressing for that fistula. So um, 
That's the correct answer. But having a fistula on its own is not an exemption strictly in terms of the medical exemption. And we were talking about foods earlier, and um, this gentleman said um, about Indian foods, and um, could that affect the kidney problem? Well, we tend to kind of allow people to eat the kind of normal foods they would eat. So the turmeric in, in a meal is probably not going to be the same extreme of turmeric that you would consume if you were taking a supplement. Um, so we do t say to patients, you can continue eating your normal diet or you can have an Indian. That's not a problem. It's just when they're taking supplements, which are kind of very concentrated dose. Thank you. Um, we're talking about COVID now. So the um, COVID-19 antibody therapies are no longer recommended by the World Health Organization. Um, what's your thoughts on this? Um, I'm not sure I knew that. I, I know typically in hospital, we're still using the maps like tocilizumab and sotrovimab. I don't think there's been a big change in the UK unless I'm wrong, Catherine. Do you know anything different? No, we've not been doing anything different. No, I didn't know about that either. So that was um, Peter. Then if you're still on, on the call, Peter, if you want to elaborate on that, if you want to. Hi, uh, yes. Um... It was just a message that came through on uh, an email feed that we get, and it was to do with uh, Sotrovimab and Regeneron were no longer recommended by the World Health Organization, although they're still recommended by the European Health Medicines Agency. I can't remember exactly. Is it health? Anyway, um, and I was just wondering if that affected how it's prescribed here and and as well as that, what are the current antibody treatments for COVID that are recommended for uh, renal patients and transplant patients in particular? Um, Regeneron, I think, um, Peter, we did use it a little bit in the UK quite a long time ago, and then it got phased out. And then depending on how symptomatic you are, and especially if you're a chronic kidney disease patient, it depends then on which treatment you're offered first. With kidney patients, like the interactions that Catherine's outlined, we have to be quite careful with the oral ones, one's called Paxlovid and one's called Monuperavir, particularly for the interactions. Um, and then depending on how bad your symptoms are in the onset, you may be offered a MAB first, so Sotrovimab, and that's often now given in community centers so like local hubs rather than in the hospitals and then if you were more symptomatic there are still antiviral medicines like remdesivir that can be given and they're suitable for kidney patients sometimes we have to reduce the dose or give them um, less often and I think and we'd still use high dose steroids and oxygen and things like that so our we still do have that armory of treatments depending on how symptomatic you are. And if you're a very clinically vulnerable patient, you're often given um, a test still to have at home. So you can almost check whether you know you've got COVID and then contact your local unit to see how they almost triage you or how they're going to manage you at that stage. So I think that's still my understanding. Um, because a lot of it's now moved out into the hub centres, I must admit I'm not, don't see as much of it, those early treatment decisions as we used to 18 months ago. Okay, thank you. I, I mean, as far as I was aware, the regime was still in place, but I haven't had an opportunity to use it, thankfully. Thank you, Peter, for that, um, for elaborating. Now, you spoke about anemia earlier on, and um, someone's put, what about post-transplant? Um, patients with anemia. Do you want to go, Catherine, or shall I? Can do. So, unfortunately, patients post transplant weren't included in the ROXID stat trials, were they? But it is a group of patients that they would probably really benefit 
from using them. So I don't know whether the experience is going to come from real world kind of data or whether there are any plans for them to kind of look at look at this population going forward because we do struggle using synthetic erythropoietin because we know it doesn't work very well in that initial kind of post-transplant period. Um, so unfortunately, they're not kind of licensing that population yet, but it is a group of patients that would potentially benefit from it. Totally agree. Do you want to add anything, Rob? Or no, um, we would, like you said, we would use the more traditional therapies if we needed and just wait to see if it improves, which it often does, does it? Right, let's have a look at a couple more questions. I think we're getting through them all, actually. Um, so we've spoke about drugs with um, the expense. Um, in general, they are quite expensive, are they, these drugs? And does that, is that to do with, um, are they prescribed or not um, on the expense or doesn't it matter? With the two that I talked about, dapagliflozin and the other one, dapagliflozin is not really expensive. It's about £35 a month. So it's quite an affordable treatment when we think about perhaps other treatments like some of the newer blood thinners, it's comparable to that or some other diabetes drugs. Um, the national guidance from in England comes from NICE and that tells us who we should offer it to. And in terms of who we should offer it to, they've thought about the costs within it. So when you're making your individual decision and deciding with the patient who you're looking after, whether they should have this drug or not, the cost then shouldn't really be part of your decision because the national guidance says we should offer it. So we should follow that. Um, that's then up to commissioners and the wider NHS to decide how they find the money for these therapies. But they've taken those decisions into account before they've done their recommendations, if you like. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, you spoke about cold and flu medications that are around and not suitable for kidney patients. Is there any particular ones that are suitable for kidney patients? If you do get a bout of a bad cold or anything? Well, actually, the evidence for all of them isn't pretty, isn't great, really. So you might be better just with paracetamol and some honey and lemon. <laughs> um, but there are things that are expectorants, so things containing guaifenesin, they're still okay for kidney patients. It's just anything that's got the decongestants in or... Um, anything with ibuprofen or any of the kind of NSAID drugs in that would we would try and avoid. Thank you, Catherine. There, there are just so many. It's a minefield now, isn't it? When you walk into your pharmacy and you're just faced with a shelf full of... <laughs> um, I love these um, drug names. I really struggle with these. So are you aware of any adverse reaction with Ramapril? Is that one for you, Robert? Yeah, Ramapril is a very common drug that's used for blood pressure and also used for preventing the progression of chronic kidney disease and heart disease and chronic heart artery disease. So it's a very useful drug. Very rarely some people get an extreme form of um, almost allergic reaction called angioedema. Um, that's very rare. More common side effects with drugs like Ramapril that end in pril it can be a very dry cough and that can tend to happen in about five to 10 out of every 100 people that might take it. Um, a consequence of all blood pressure medicines can be they can make your blood pressure slightly too low. Sometimes when you start taking them, you might be a little bit dizzy on standing. Um, they all do have lots of side effects which are printed in the licensed literature but they're the common ones that I'd probably tell someone if I was just about to give them a prescription for one for um, I think that would be my biggest two things I would say to them 
And I think this is going to be the last question. Do pharmacists take back unused drugs these days and also full sharp spins? They will take back unused drugs for you to dispose of them. Um, I'm not sure if the questioner was also wanting to know whether they're reused, but at the moment in the UK, they're not reused. I did see a little bit of work that might be coming further afield that might look at reusing them. In terms of sharp spins, we always ask people to contact their local council. Certainly in England, we do that because uh, they're responsible for taking away um, clinical waste that contains sharps or bodily fluids. But old medicines that you want to get rid of, you can take them back to your pharmacy for disposal. Catherine, so can I do you just, want to say anything? Yeah. Sorry, so in Manchester, we do have dedicated pharmacies that will take back sharp spins. They get commissioned to provide that service. So not all pharmacies will take sharp spins. They should take back unused medicines. Um, and we actually provide a list of these pharmacies to our patients when we send them home, if we have to send them home with a sharp spin, so they actually know where they can get rid of them. Thank you. Right, one, like more question. One, more, <laughs> one more question because I look like I missed it earlier. So someone's put here, they love pomegranate juice and Seville oranges. Um, does that affect any drugs? So actually, I think the interaction is more with kind of a transport protein that's in the kind of gut. So I'm not aware of any kind of real interactions if the juice is taken apart from have taken your medicines so if you had a glass of juice four hours after you've taken your medicines then that interaction theoretically shouldn't be there anymore with Seville oranges but yeah it's more a kind of a absorption interaction than um than anything else brilliant well, I think we've answered all the questions and thank you very much for your time, Catherine and Robert. And if there's any friends or colleagues that want to hear this and they didn't manage to um, take part today, you can go online tomorrow around about sort of 10 o'clock onwards onto our website and we'll have the watch again um, where you can watch it and share it with your friends. And don't forget, next month is our patient conference or our patient event. It's online and we've got lots of speakers so please register for that as well. So thank you very much for your time and have a lovely evening. Thank you. Catherine, thank you. Robert, if you want to stay on just till the end, please.